Often in life, we hear about people who are inspirational. And uh, what we mean by that is that these are people who uh, do things that we consider to be great or amazing. And uh, the idea of them being inspirational is that we are motivated to try and follow their example, to try and do the great and amazing things that they have done. Now, as I have uh, worked in Christian ministry for the last 23 years or so, uh, there have been a number of people who have inspired me, particularly when times have been tough. But one in particular was Richard Johnson, uh, the man who brought the gospel to Australia, uh, the chaplain to the First Fleet, the first Anglican minister in this country. Now, Richard Johnson was a guy who uh, persevered in that role for a number of years, and boy, he went through some hard times. So imagine spending a significant number of months on a crowded ship coming from England to here to start with, and then imagine getting here and there's nothing, <laughs> no house to live in, no shopping centres to get food from. You've got to start it all from scratch. Okay. Uh, now, Richard Johnson was the chaplain. It wasn't like he had a staff team. He didn't have a youth and kids worker and a pastoral worker to help. He was it. And he had a whole colony uh, to minister to. And a number of the people weren't particularly uh, keen uh, for his ministry. Indeed, the first uh, governor, Arthur Phillip, uh, didn't like Richard Johnson preaching the gospel. He'd rather that Johnson had preached sermons that were more about morals. Uh, governor Gross, the second governor of the colony, he was hostile to Richard Johnson. Uh, indeed, he would not allow convicts to come to Johnson's services. Uh, th the only time that a service was allowed was Sunday morning at 6 a.m. and only for 45 minutes. And uh, the drummers of the army had a habit of playing their drums uh, nearby when the church service was on. Uh, 30 or 40 people maybe would come to the service. Uh, this is a guy who um, received no government funding to build a church. He had to build the first church building all by himself out of his own funds. Uh, that building was later burnt down as part of the opposition against him. And, and so you see that Richard Johnson's time as the chaplain was not easy. Very, very hard. And so whenever I go through hard times in ministry, I think about Richard Johnson, I think, man, I've got it really good compared to him. And his perseverance inspires me to keep on persevering. Uh, indeed, uh, John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace that we just uh, sung before, he was uh, Richard Johnson's mentor. And he would write letters to Richard Johnson to encourage him. And one of the letters that uh, he wrote to Richard Johnson said, uh, you're, you're probably never going to see uh, the great fruit of your ministry in your lifetime. Uh, it'll be subsequent generations that will benefit ultimately from this ministry. And here we are today, right? Here we are today. Uh, God started that work through Richard Johnson and it continues on through us today. So I've always found Richard Johnson to be quite inspiring. I hope you find him inspiring too. But uh, this morning as we look at Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 to chapter 12 verse 3, uh, the writer to the Hebrews wants us to be inspired by a number of different people that we read about in the Bible. And he wants us to be inspired by them so that we persevere as followers of Jesus, so that we keep following Jesus and not give up no matter what life throws up at us. And all of this brings me to my first point, which is that we will be helped to persevere in the faith by taking inspiration from the people of faith in the Old Testament. So look at Hebrews 12 verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So really, this sentence, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, is, is really kind of 
the big thing that the writer is trying to communicate to his readers throughout this letter. Keep going. Remember that these people were thinking about giving up on Jesus because they were facing persecution for being followers of Jesus. They were thinking it would be easier to go back to being religious Jews. The writer is saying, no, persevere, keep on going, throw off whatever it is that's going to stop you from persevering. But he talks about this great cloud of witnesses. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, And this great cloud of witnesses is the list of people that are spoken about in Hebrews chapter 11. People who persevere. Indeed, uh, look at what Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 2 says. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. The ancients referring to the people of faith in the Old Testament times. Now, we're given a description of faith in verse 1, confidence in what we hope for. So there's a a future aspect to faith, assurance about what we do not see. And I want to suggest to you that's talking about a present kind of aspect of faith. And really, this description of faith is fleshed out for us through the rest of chapter 11. And I want to suggest to you that uh, there are five ways in which this description of faith is fleshed out for us. The first is this, that the Old Testament believers were committed to obeying and pleasing the God they could not see. Look at verses 5 to 6. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So the writer refers to a man named Enoch. We read about Enoch in Genesis 5. Enoch, we are told, was a man who pleased God and because God was happy with how Enoch pleased him, God took him before he died. But notice though that verse 6 is saying you can't please God without faith. You can't please God without faith because anyone who comes to him first of all must believe that he exists. Remember, verse 1 says that faith is the assurance of what we cannot see. Enoch believed in God and sought to please God even though he could not see God. Okay? But notice, he didn't just believe that God exists, he also believed that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. So what motivated Enoch to please this God that he could not see was also the belief that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. And that's why he lived a life pleasing to God, because of his belief, of his faith, of his trust in those two things. Now, friends, one thing I want to say is that Enoch's faith was not a blind faith. Many people think that uh, Christians have faith in God for no good reason. But I want to suggest they're wrong. Uh, Psalm 19, Romans chapter 1 tell us that as we look at the world around us, we can see clear evidence of God's eternal power and divine nature. Uh, Indeed, friends, as uh, we look at what science uncovers, we see a very orderly world. Uh, We see a world where, for my way of thinking, it's obvious that someone has designed this. Like, think about the plausibility. Is it more plausible that the world is the way that it is because we have a creator who designed it all or because it all happened by chance? Well, for me, it seems obvious that someone has made this. Uh, Romans 1 says that those who deny that there is a creator on the basis of what we see in creation are actually suppressing the truth in their wickedness. It is so obvious 
when you look at the world around us that there is a God, that to say no is actually an act of wickedness. But more than that, Enoch was able to see that there is a God, but I suspect too that the reason why he knew that this God actually, you know, rewards those who earnestly seek him was probably because of what he had heard about how God had acted in the past. So we saw that when Abel uh, presented a, a, an offering that was pleasing to God, that God was pleased with Abel. And so it seems that on the basis of what he saw in creation, on the basis of what he had heard about God, that he trusted that there was a God, that this God earnestly re uh, rewards those who earnestly seek him, and so he committed himself to pleasing God. That's the idea. Now, friends, we have even more reason than Enoch uh, to believe that there is a God and that we should actually seek to please him. Ultimately, as Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 onwards tells us, God has revealed himself to us in his Son. In the past, he spoke through the prophets, now in his Son. And friends, everything that we know about Jesus accords with history. It accords with the evidence that we have of history. We, we know he lived, uh, we know he died, uh, the most plausible explanation for the empty tomb was that he was raised from the dead. And if Jesus was raised from the dead, then everything that the Bible says about Jesus is true. And we know that as we put our faith in Jesus and we commit ourselves to living for him, that a great reward is to come. Enoch knew less than what we know. Yet his faith was in God and he sought to please God because of his faith. We have even more reason to do that. So that's the first uh, aspect of faith that comes out of this passage. The second is this, that the Old Testament believers had confidence that God would fulfill his promises about the future and this confidence shaped their actions in the present. So look at verse 7a, by faith Noah when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. God says to Noah, Noah, I'm going to send a big flood. Build a big ark. Noah takes God at his word about the future. And he built a big ark. Uh, he probably had people ridiculing him for building such a big monstrosity. But he did so, why? Why were his actions in the present focused on doing that? Because he trusted in what God said about the future. Uh, not just Noah, have a look at uh, Joseph, uh, chapter 11, verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. So Joseph's great-grandfather Abraham in Genesis 15 was told that uh, his descendants, the people of Israel, would end up in Egypt uh, in slavery for 400 years, but that God would rescue them and bring them to the land that God had promised to Abraham. Joseph believed that promise about the future. And so in that present time, he said, knowing that that's what's going to happen, I give the order that my bones are to be taken up to the promised land when God fulfills that promise. The future determined Joseph's present. And finally, Moses, uh, verses 25, 26, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Uh, it's pretty good to be a part of a royal family. Uh, if you're a part of a royal family, you're probably going to be richer than most in the place where you live. You're going to have all of these privileges which others don't have. And Moses, as you remember, by the grace of God, was adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh. He grew up in the royal family. And it could have been very easy for Moses to have thought, well, this life is pretty good. Let's enjoy being part of the royal family. Let's enjoy all the riches and the pleasures that come with that. But no, Moses had a greater hope. He looked forward to heaven 
And he believed that what was to come as a result of God's promises was far better than being a part of the royal family of Egypt. He also concluded that he could not follow God faithfully and be a part of the royal family and partake in all that the, all that the royal family partook in at that time. He knew that if he was going to follow God, he would have to distance himself from that and instead be treated with disgrace and scorn. But he was willing to let go of all the treasures and pleasures of the royal family, knowing that something better was to come. His faith in the future shaped the way he lived now. And friends, I suspect that we're in a situation a bit like that of Moses in this world. Uh, we might not be a part of a royal family, but we certainly live in a prosperous country, don't we? Uh, it's certainly, you know, uh, promised in this country, you do all the right things, you can have treasures, you can have pleasures. But quite often, friends, can I say that the pursuit of those things will always come at the expense of being faithful to God. Jesus said you can't love both God and money. A love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Pursuing that path will steer you away inevitably from God. And yes, you might have treasures for a while, but you'll miss out on the treasures that are to come. No, friends, it is worth being faithful to God now and forsaking things now because what is to come is far better. That's how Moses lived. And the encouragement here is for us to do likewise. Thirdly, the Old Testament believers had confidence that God had the power to do the miraculous. Uh, look at verses 17 and 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. In Genesis 12, God gave Abraham some very, very significant promises. Many descendants, fame, uh, divine protection, the promise of land, but also the promise that through him, that blessing would come to peoples of the different nations. Now, Abraham gets older and he doesn't see uh, all of these promises fulfilled in their ultimate sense and he's told that these promises would flow on through a son. Do you remember how old Abraham was when he finally had that son through whom the promises would go? Well, he was 100. Sarah was 90. It was quite a miraculous birth that happened there. Well, just imagine Abraham's shock when about 15 or so years later, God says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. You know the one that I've promised all the blessings will go through him? I want you to sacrifice him. And Abraham, without flinching, goes ahead and does what is needed to sacrifice his son. Literally has him on an altar, ready to stab him and kill him, when the angel of God intervenes. Why would Abraham do that? Well, friends, I think that Abraham trusted that God was faithful in keeping his promises. He'd certainly seen that with the birth of Isaac. But I think he also trusted that God had the power to keep his promises. He had certainly seen that with Isaac, but now he's probably thinking, what's God doing here? God has promised that through this child, all the promises will keep going on. So if I kill him, well, God must obviously have a plan to raise him from the dead. So Abraham believed that God could do the miraculous. Not just Abraham, though, the people of Israel, Abraham's descendants at times, demonstrated faith in God's miraculous power. So in verses 29 to 30, by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. Just imagine the setting. You've got an army that's chasing you and then suddenly the sea in front of you parts and there are walls of water and you are told, go through. 
what would you be thinking as you're about to go through? I'd be thinking, I'd be thinking, are those walls of water about to come crashing down? But what do the people do? They have faith and they go through trusting in the miraculous power of God. Uh, the people of Israel, once they're in the promised land, are told that as they march around the city of Jericho, that God will actually bring down these seemingly indestructible walls. And that's what they did. They trusted in God's miraculous power and God's miraculous power was certainly seen by them. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you trust that God can do the miraculous? Is that shown by the way you pray? Think, think about the things that you ask God to do. Do the things that you ask God to do reflect that you think that God can only do a certain amount or that he can do things that we just think are impossible? What do your prayers say about your faith in that respect? What Hebrews teaches us is that genuine faith is shown by believing that God has the power to do the miraculous. Let us pray that God might indeed work through us in miraculous ways. Fourthly, the Old Testament believers persevered in faith despite suffering and the threat of death. Look at verses 35b to 38. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These people kept the faith in God, kept trusting in this God that they could not see, kept trying to please this God, uh, kept living in light of the promises that God had made for the future, kept believing that God could do the miraculous, even though it meant suffering for them, even though it meant death for some of them. They were willing to do that. Uh, friends, anyone who tells you that the Christian life will be easy and free from suffering is not telling the truth because that's not what the Bible says. The Old Testament people of faith, they suffered because of their faith. Jesus made it clear that if he was persecuted, then we, his people, can expect persecution. The Apostle Paul said that anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Friends, perseverance in the faith is not dependent upon life being easy. The perseverance that has been called for is perseverance in the, in the face of suffering and even potential death. Remember that the original readers of Hebrews were thinking about giving up on Jesus because of persecution, because of suffering. And the writer is saying, look at these Old Testament people of faith. They suffered. They died yet they persevered. And friends, the next point that the, the writer makes highlights how we have even more reason for perseverance in the face of suffering than the people of the old did. Because what we see is that the Old Testament believers never saw God's promises fulfilled as we have. Uh, look at uh, chapter 11, verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Uh, these people didn't see the kingdom to come in their life. They didn't see it. Uh, Abraham in Genesis 23, even though he was in the land that God had promised to give him, described himself as a foreigner and stranger. He didn't believe his citizenship was on earth, but his citizenship is in heaven. Okay, uh, Verses 39 to 40, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since 
God had planned something better for us. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. Friends, what this verse is saying is that the people of old didn't see God's promises fulfilled, but we have certainly seen them fulfilled in Jesus in part. Through Jesus, we've learned in recent weeks, we have now been made perfect before God as we have faith. Because through the sacrifice of Jesus, we have been cleansed of our sins. We are now forgiven. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us who come in faith asking for forgiveness. We have been perfected. The Old Testament people didn't experience that cleansing of the conscience. We have it. Good news for those people though is that Jesus' sacrifice makes them perfect too. It's retrospective as well. But friends, more than that, you know that Hebrews 12 verse 22 onwards, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks, talks about that we now have come to the heavenly Mount Zion. We have now come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You might say, how on earth have we come to the heavenly Jerusalem? We're still here in Layla Park on earth. Well, friends, by faith in Jesus, we now become united with Jesus. We now have this spiritual unity with Jesus. And so spiritually speaking, we are where Jesus is. And where's Jesus now? In heaven. The book of Ephesians talks about this idea. We've been raised to the heavenlies in Christ. So we, spiritually speaking, are now with Christ in heaven. We'll tease that more out in a few weeks. But we've also been given a taste of heaven by another means, and that is by the giving of the Holy Spirit to us. Friends, the Spirit, we are told, is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance to come. And as we experience his power of transformation in our life, we are tasting heaven itself. That's what Hebrews 6 tells us. And so, yes, even though the fullness of the promise of heaven has still not yet come, we are now experiencing it in part something that the people of old never had. We now know that we're perfect. We now are tasting heaven through the experience of the Spirit. We're in a much more advantageous position than those Old Testament people of faith, and yet they were willing to suffer and to face death and remain faithful to God. If they were willing to do that, how much more reason do we have today having experienced, in part, the fulfilment of these promises that God made. All the way back in the Old Testament to Abraham, we now have experienced. Friends, when I look at Richard Johnson, who I was talking about at the start, his circumstances are much more difficult than mine. <laughs> And so, of course, I go, of course, I've got to persevere in ministry. If he did it and it was a lot worse then, surely I should. And that's what the writer is saying to his readers. You're thinking life is hard for you? Well, think about how hard it was for the people of old and they persevered and they didn't experience the things that you have now experienced because of Jesus. Friends, the people of the Old Testament were not perfect. And it's a shame I can't go through every single example that's listed here in Hebrews 11. But they were people of faith who persevered. And the writer lists these different people to inspire us to keep persevering, as those people did. But it's not just the Old Testament people of faith that he wants us to be inspired by in this passage. Secondly, we will be helped to persevere in the faith by taking inspiration from Jesus' willingness to suffer and die knowing he would receive glory. Look at uh, verses 1b to 3. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. 
For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus is described here as the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Basically, that means that he is, if you like, the one who covers everything from the beginning and the end for us to be saved by faith. He has done everything that is needed for us to be saved. And he continues to intercede for us today. So there is nothing that we do to be saved. All we do is trust in what Jesus has done. He who is the pioneer and perfecter of faith. But notice what he wants us to really focus on about Jesus. Notice Jesus endures suffering. He suffered for our sake. But notice what was driving him as he came to that suffering. It was the joy set before him. And that joy that was set before him was the glory that he gave up when he became a baby. The glory of heaven itself. All the pleasures and treasures of heaven itself. Uh, he knew it was his father's will for him to come to earth and to do the things that he did to save people and then to go back and to receive that glory that was once his. And so as Jesus comes up to this time of suffering, what is he focused on? The glory to come. The joy that will be his as he enjoy, enjoys that glory, but also the joy that will be his as we share in that with him. And that is what motivated Jesus to do all that he did. And friends, the writer wants us to be inspired by Jesus' example. The writer wants us to be focused on the joy that is to come through Jesus, to keep our eyes on that and to keep looking at that and to not stop looking at that and to keep persevering, knowing that it doesn't matter what pain we go through now, that pain is far outweighed by the gain of the glory that is to come. And friends, when Hebrews calls upon us to encourage one another, as we heard last week, we encourage one another by reminding one another about what is to come and that it is worth it now to pursue following Jesus, to pursue the path of faith no matter the cost because of the joy that is to come. Be inspired not only by the fact that Christ saved you, be inspired by that glory and the way in which he went through suffering knowing that that glory would come. That's the path that we're called to follow. So brothers and sisters, this is not a hard passage to understand. Uh, the call of the passage is very simple, isn't it? Persevere in faith. Don't give up. And so persevering in faith means that we will uh, continue to believe in the God that we cannot see and seek to please him. It means that we will continue to trust in his promises that are to come and live our lives now in light of those. It means that we will pray, trusting that God can do the miraculous. It means that we will keep doing those things, knowing that we will potentially suffer. And it means that we'll be willing to suffer, knowing that the glory is to come, which comes only because of Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith, the one who has done everything needed for us to enjoy that great glory to come. Let us encourage one another by these examples that we read about in the scriptures, by Jesus himself, to keep persevering. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you uh, for this wonderful passage from uh, Hebrews. Uh, we thank you, Father God, for uh, this wonderful roll call of Old Testament people of faith. Uh, and we thank you, Father God, for the way in which they can inspire us uh, to keep trusting in you. But ultimately, we thank you for Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. We thank you that he's done everything necessary to save us. And we thank you for his willingness, his commitment uh, to suffer for our sake 
But Father, we thank you for the joy that drove him to do that and which drives us today too. And may it continue to drive us and help us to remind one another about it. Father God, please help us as your people to persevere in the faith no matter what life throws at us. And we commit these things to you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.